Howdy folks, uh, welcome to Public Health GIS. Uh, my name is Joel Capajan and I will be your instructor uh, this semester. I apologize for uh, not being there for the first day of classes. I have been in El Salvador teaching, doing research, consulting for the last 20 days and I expect to go back uh, this Saturday on the 25th. Uh, it's a mix uh, emotions. Um, I hear it's pretty cold out there. So I'm kind of not looking forward uh, to going to that. Uh, but you know, that semester is starting. And so that's just the way it goes. So I this is, since I will not be there um, uh, today, m my thought process was to create a video where I explain a little bit about the course. And also I go through the lab. Now, you can watch this video from the comfort of your own home, that is totally fine, um, but you are also encouraged to go to the class and, to, uh, and go through the, uh, through the lab with the help of Kai if you feel that you need any help. Either one of those two approaches will be uh, totally fine. Um, so let's get started. Public Health GIS. All right. So... Um, here we have a little bit of my um, contact info. Email is probably the best way to reach me. Um, and I also have office hours every Wednesday from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Of course, if you cannot make that, then email me and then we'll find a way to meet either at another time, another day, or perhaps through the phone. Um, the class TA is going to be Kai. That's, uh, you, you'll find his information also in the syllabus. Um, and his office hours are Tuesdays from 1 p.m. Uh, to 3 p.m. or by appointment, all in room 1107A. So what is this course about? Um, well, this course is about GIS, Geographic Information Systems, as a tool for public health, researchers, and practitioners. Um, so uh, the GIS for Public Health course uh, is going to offer you guys an opportunity to gain skills using uh, GIS uh, software, particularly QGIS, um, and apply spatial analysis techniques for public health research questions. So the goal is answer research questions through mapping, through spatial um, analysis. Uh, we are going to get a lot of practice um, uh, doing that through primarily through weekly labs. So we're gonna work in the labs together. Um, and oftentimes the homework uh, is gonna be a uh, sort of direct product of those labs uh, or an extension uh, of those labs. Um, two required texts are here, GIS for Public Health, the second edition, and also Jeremy Porter's uh, geographic, uh, geographical sociology as well, all of which are uh, available to you um, uh, through Columbia University Library. There's also optional tax um, that you may um, use. So a little bit about the course, right? The, the objective, the point of this course is to acquaint you with the methods to analyze spatially referenced social public health data with the procedures appropriate for social science theoretical base. That's a mouthful. Really, what we're trying to do uh, is for you guys is to is to uh, expose you to not only the software but also the theory and the best way in the latest ways to sort of um, in, to incorporate spatial data analysis into not just descriptive statistics and and uh, in finding significant clusters but also incorporating that into more complex uh, regression models. So there's gonna be a little bit of everything uh, uh, for everybody. We're gonna start very light and simple, get into another software, and we're going to end up uh, really running some very sophisticated uh, regression uh, models. So grading procedures, where are, the, where are the grades come from? Well, the grades are going to come from essentially three sources. One of them is going to be your midterms and final exam, both of which are worth 40%, 20% each. Um, those exams, uh, the, the midterm and the final exam are going to be take-home uh, exams. You're going to have about a week 
um, uh, to analyze some data that I'm going to give you and some simple questions, so very straightforward. Um, 30% of the grade is going to come from the weekly labs that we're going to work uh, in the um, uh, during class. Uh, and the other 30% are going to come from a semester-long final research project. And in this semester-long final research project, um, the goal will be uh, for you to come up with a research question, do an annotated bibliography, collect some basic information, find some data, and um, answer that research question through uh, a mapping or spatial um, analysis, right? So this semester length research project really will uh, culminate with a poster presentation at the end of the semester in which students and other faculty members are going to be invited to visit, review, um, and ask questions. It's a very important part of the, the, of the course, um, and I expect you all to take that very, very seriously. Um, here, uh, the course topics in general schedule, uh, you'll find the tentative schedule. We're going to try to, um, to stick to this as much as possible. Um, we might fall a little bit behind or speed up a little bit, but I think generally uh, we tend to cover all of it. Uh, you'll find the week, the date, the topic, of what you're supposed to be reading, but also the assignments that are due. And as you can see, oh, every week you have a lab too. And in some weeks, you have part of the research project uh, due. So essentially, to make this uh, final research project more manageable, um, I've broken it down, really, into several smaller um, assignments. Like in the first assignment, uh, I'm going to have you guys write up uh, a small uh, a page about the topic uh, in one abstract, a one paragraph abstract of the general topic. The second assignment, it's going to be sort of an annotated bibliography where you're going to get at least uh, 10 academic sources to build some background information about the, the research problem that you're interested in. Then I'm um, also going to have you uh, collect some data and give me at least a preliminary map uh, uh, that's, that's, going to be, that's going to be due March 29th. Um, and then we're going to take a week off um, to do the final research poster. Um, and then we're going to have the final poster presentation. Again, the whole point of me breaking it down is just to uh, make it manageable and really troubleshoot. It's, this is really all about uh, troubleshooting. Uh, you're going to find, I think part of the learning process is to find data that is not perfect and be able to uh, sort of clean it up and use it in a way that answers your research questions. You'll find that to be uh, not as straightforward as it sounds. And I think that's quite a uh, uh, part of the learning experience besides just um, doing the maps and doing the spatial um, analysis. So that's pretty much everything that I'm going to uh, sort of cover in this uh, very small introduction, very short introduction of the course. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you're free to ask Kai or uh, just wait for me. And next Wednesday, I'll be there. You can ask um, all the questions that uh, you want. See you guys in a few days. From now on, uh, we are going to be linking up publicly available population data uh, to publicly available uh, geographic data, shape files, right? Um, essentially, lab one is the closest thing to a real life scenario where there is a uh, uh, there's a map that you want to create. In our case, we want to create a map of population of population change across New York New York State counties uh, for the year 2018, uh, and we have no data, right? So the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to click on on, on that link, which I realize is gone dead, but not to worry. All you really have to do. Uh, is go to Google, uh, type U.S. Census Geographies, uh, you click on the first link, and that should take you um, to the desired uh, page. We are then going to click on Geographies. 
we are then going to click on geographic mapping files. We want a uh, population change across New York state counties for the year 2018. So we're going to click in the year 2018. And um, we are going to click on the mapping files, the cartographic boundary files or shape files, also known as shape files. Now you have a bunch of choices. You have American Indian, Alaska Native American, Hawaiian homelands. You also have a shape files or map files of congressional districts, uh, the, the 116th Congress. You have county level um, uh, uh, files, um, uh, county, county within congressional districts. You have divisions. You have a, a bunch of different unit of analysis that you may be interested uh, in mapping. Uh, for the purposes of this uh, lab, we're going to be using the county level uh, mapping data and mapping file. Um, and we're going to be using the, the 20 meter, which is a lower resolution uh, file. So we're going to download that. And we're going to open that up. Now, when you open this up, you see a bunch of distinct files, right? Um, and now all of these files really make up the map that you later are going to see in QGIS. Um, all of these files have different information about the maps. As you can imagine, a map is not just a map. A map is uh, contains the shapes, um, which is contained by the shape file. There's also a projection file. There's also a database file that we're going to be using to link up other additional information. And there are other files that you will find there as well. Now, the file that we're always interested in opening is always going to have um, the extension SHP for shape file. That's the one that we want to open. But realize this, that for a map to open, all of these files have to be together in a folder. Um, in, in, particularly for our case, um, since we have this data in a compressed file, it's really important to realize that you won't be able to open this in QGIS in a compressed file. Um, you're going to you're going to have um, to sort of uh, save this uh, in an actual file. So um, one of the things that I enjoy doing, and I think it's a good practice for you as well, um, is to um, so let's put this here. Is to organize. Is to really organize. Um, is to organize my data. So if you go, if I go to courses, um, Columbia Public Health GIS, and week one, you're going to have. You know, I have a folder pretty much for all of the labs, right? For all of the labs, I have a folder. I feel like it's a good practice for you to organize all the data that we're going to be using in this course in such manner, um, just because it will make things so much easier for you to find stuff later on. Anyways, I have my week one, and I created a U.S. county file, right? Obviously, I downloaded this before, but, you know, we can just delete it, um, and I can just highlight this and paste all this information there. Uh, and now I have all my information in just a regular file. And I'm going to be using that to open that in QGIS. Now that we have this data, now we can just uh, open uh, QGIS. All right, that took a little while, uh, but it did open. Now, there are different ways for you um, to open a shapefile into QGIS. Um, one way uh, is for you to go, uh, go to Layer. Um, you're going to go to Add Layer, and we're going to be adding a vector uh, layer. You're going uh, to search. Uh, for the location of the file. In my case, uh, I have it in uh, week one, U.S. County, um, County, 
and I'm going to open again. The file that you really want to open is the shape file, uh, but always remember all of them have to be there together. then you're going to click on add and you're going to see a map of the uh, contiguous United States, Alaska and its territories um, uh, and, and, its, and its territories. So this map uh, contains all the information that we really need. Now there are different options you know to grab the map and move things around. Uh, the option that I prefer is to use a pen map option. This allows me to sort of grab it, click, grab it, and move it around. I can, using the, the, the mouse pad in my laptop, I can also just um, zoom in. Or if I want, I can just uh, click on this button, zoom in. And if I click on a particular area, it will zoom in for me. Now, you can also zoom out and it will do the opposite, obviously. Um, there are other ways that you can do you can, There's other choices. Another choice that you have is the identify feature. Let's say that you're interested in a particular county. You don't know the name of the county. You can just click on information, uh, click on the county that you're interested, and uh, it will show you that this is Campbell uh, uh, County. Nothing particularly groundbreaking. Um, but that's, uh, these are some of the choices um, that you have. Um, you can just go back to uh, pan uh, adoption and you can just also um, zoom out. Now, uh, when you first start with QGIS, um, it will often happen that it will often happen that you will lose sort of your map, like you. You might be working on something, and you might be working on something, and suddenly some of your map is just like totally gone. You don't know where it is. You don't know where it is. There's several way, There's several ways to do this. One way to do this is to zoom full. That will return back to the original size. Um, also, if you cannot find your map, another way is just to do a right click on the layer that you're on, and you can zoom to layer. And again, it will bring you back to that original uh, map. Now, obviously, this is just the map that we see. But underneath this map, there's a lot of information. You have a projection. And importantly, in our case with this lab, is that you also have a database, right? Um, and if you click on this open attribute table in, in, in the GIS world, Databases are often referred to attribute tables. So you can click on the attribute table and you will have, um, you will see sort of the database underneath, uh, underneath, all, all, all underneath the map. So you have data, a code, of the, the state FIB, which is the code for the state. You also have a county FIB, which is the code for the county. And you have a combination of the county fit um, and the state fit. Um, and you also have a GOID as well, which will come in handy uh, later. You have also the name of, of, um, of the county and the area of land and the area of water contained within each of those counties. Not a whole lot of information. But enough information, enough ideas for us to be able to link this um, to other sources of data. Now, one way that sort of we can do this, but before we actually get there, uh, the first thing that we want to do is we want to get rid of all the counties from states that we don't care about. Remember, our goal today is to map population change 
for all counties across uh, New York State, and now we have all counties in the U.S. So we need one way, we need to find a way to select these counties and export these counties into different maps. So just, just we have a map of the United States counties, I mean, not New York State counties, not United State counties. So one way to do this is that you is to go to another way to actually go to the attribute table is to right click on the layer go to upper, uh, open attribute table um, now the the state fit for the state of new york is 36 right so what we can do is to ask to make a selection uh, based on a particular this particular information so we can highlight those states uh, those counties that belong to New York State. Now, um, here, uh, if you click on these uh, on this button, you have select features using an expression. So that's exactly what we're going to do, right? Um, you are going to go to um, <clears throat> fields and values. You're going to click on state fields. Quotation marks 36. There we go. Um, select this feature. So close this. And now you see that all the counties uh, where the state is 36 have been highlighted. If you were to close this, uh, it would look like this. Right. So now the only uh, now the only uh, counties that have been selected or highlighted are those counties that are within the state of New York. So what we want to do is extract the, is, is extract those counties into its own map separate from that this layer. And the way to do that is simply to do a save as. So you're going to right click, right? you're going to export, and then you're going to go to save selected features as. Right? You're going to see that a window is going to pop up. You're going to search for a place to it. And you can literally put that in the same U.S. county uh, file, but you can make all these New York State counties. You can save that. Importantly, you got to make sure that this is click save only selected features. You want to select only the selected features, not the unselected, and also add a save file. Uh, to the map, you're going to click OK, and now you're going to have two layers, one that is the New York State County and the other layer, which is just the original layer. Now, if you want, you can just click this off and you'll see that the, the original layer is still there. And you can click the, the original layer and the only thing that you will see is the, uh, the state layer that you're interested in working, uh, working with. Um, since we don't really need the original layer, you can just um, right click and you can click on remove layer or you can just click on this and also click this remove layer button. And now we just have the file that we're interested in. Remember, now that we have this file and you can just open the attribute uh, table and again, you're going to have the state, which is all 36, the county FIP or the county code, and also the geographic um, the geographic ID, which is a, both a combination of the state and the county uh, codes. All right? These are just ways for you to link information up with other publicly available um, uh, data. So now that we have the information, uh, the geographic boundaries, now it's time for us to find another source of information to link up. Remember, the goal is to map population change across New York State counties. And so there are many different sources of information, but today we're going to be using the American Fact Finder uh, website. So if you click on this link, which should definitely work, apparently it does not work. There we go. We're going to be doing a search for a change of population. So I'm going to be looking for information about people. Uh, you're going to click uh, next. 
and we're interested about population change. So you can click on population change. Right? Now we click next. Geographic type uh, is going to be county. You're going to select the New York State. And you're going to select all counties within New York, add to selection. Next, it is also going to ask us for um, if you want data on race and ethnic group. Uh, we don't, uh, so we're just going to skip this step. And if we go down here to advanced search, click on advanced search. <clears throat> and so we are going to select uh, estimates of the components of resident population change uh, from April 20, uh, from April 1st, 2010 to July 1st, 2018. So you're going to select uh, this data. Download it. And this is going to give you a compressed file. And in this compressed file, um, you're going to have several pieces of information. You're going to have uh, metadata, which is essentially um, a codebook of all the data available um, within um, the data set. Let's see if I can open this here. Right. So essentially, you're going to have an ID, an ID, an ID2, and a, a bunch of different variables and exactly what they mean. You can uh, save this, but we really don't need it uh, for now. The one that we're really interested in um, is this. Uh, data is the actual um, data set. And so um, if you want, you can just um, drag this into the file with, that contains the uh, US county file, shape files, and the New York State uh, county files. So you can close this now. You can close this. Um, and open again uh, QGIS. So now we need to actually um, open or bring in uh, the uh, delimiter file, comma delimiter file that we just uh, downloaded. So you're going to click on add layer and then click on add delimiter text layer. You're going to search for the actual file, and here it is. Uh, you should know that you, the number of header lines to this car it should be one because we want to the actual to use the actual description, <coughs> and no uh, no geometry because we're not really using um, any type of geometry. We're not plotting coordinates per se. Um, you can use that, and um, you can then um, click on Add. When you click on Add, then you have successfully um, inserted uh, the uh, data set um, into QGIS. You can click on that. You can open the attribute table, and essentially, you're going to have all the same data uh, that you will see on the wall if you just open it in Excel. Pretty much the same thing. Again, you have an ID, you have an ID2, and an ID2 is just a combination of 36, which is the uh, FIP code for New York State and the FIP code for the county. Uh, and essentially, we're going to be using this particular ID to link both, uh, both data sets. So essentially, ID number two in the CVS file um, and um, and GOID 
in the shape file are exactly the same, we're going to be using that information to make a join. So how do we do that? Well, you're going to go click, uh, going to right click, go to properties. Properties. All right, that did not work. Um, you're going to go to properties and let's see if this works. You're going to go to properties and you're going to go to joins. All right. Uh, when you go to joins, uh, you're going to click on the plus button. For some reason, this thing does not want to be smaller. But there's a little green plus button on the bottom that you're going to be using. You're going to click on that, and this is going to open. All right. So the join data is the actual... Uh, come with the limited file that we just uploaded. The join field is ID2, which is equivalent to the GOID that is in the shape file. Uh, we're going to uh, sort of join the data in a virtual memory so we can see it. Um, if you click on the on join fields, you can select of which fields you want to actually join. We don't need all, those of this, all this information. We are really interested in the total population change, so we're only going to click on this file. Now, uh, sometimes you, when in the real world, sometimes you're joining, making joins from uh, three, four different types of files. Uh, sometimes it's good to keep uh, uh, to keep a track of that. One way of doing that is if you click on custom field name prefix, you can just sort of say put a J in there to make sure that you know that this is this information. It's not original to the data set, rather it comes from a, a joint. Um, you can then click OK. And once you click OK, you're going to click on Apply and OK. So now if you click and open, uh, click the layer, open the attribute table, you're going to have all the same information that you saw lay, uh, earlier plus one more. This information is the population change, right? Um, it could be negative if you drop the number of people, or it could be positive if you increase the number of people in the last eight uh, years. Now, so right now, so this, the joint is complete, right? Let's say you're very happy with this. If you're happy with this, then what you really want to do is actually save this joint. So you're going to go to export, um, save feature as, um, and you can just save it in the same folder as we have everything else. So you can just say New York State <coughs> County. <coughs> uh, save. And you're going to click OK. And see, we have another layer now with the joint information uh, being permanent. So we can just uh, get rid of this layer. <coughs> Sorry, guys, I have a bad cough. All this air, all this hotel air is getting to me. <coughs> all right, so now it's time to actually uh, map this out, right? So to map this out, you are going to um, click on uh, right click on the layer, click on properties. Then you are going to go to symbology and you're going to click on this Dropbox menu, right? Uh, usually when you're dealing with categorical data, you're going to use categorize and when you're dealing with numeric data, you're going to be using graduated. All right. In column, you're going to select the attribute that you're interested in. We're interested in population change, so we're going to click on that. All right. uh, precision, we're going to keep the precision at we're going to keep the precision at zero. This is for decimal places. 
uh, we are going to select something that goes from red to blue uh, or from blue to red with blue meaning a drop in population, a cool down in population, and red meaning a heat up or increasing population. <coughs> now you have to select how to uh, categorize this, right? So now you can choose, or let's say, four classes. And the different ways to break up the data, uh, you can use equal intervals, you can use quantiles, essentially we'll split the distribution in four quantiles, you can use the natural breaks, the janks, or standard deviation, or the pretty janks. Uh, there are different advantages and disadvantages uh, for each of these. It just depends on which classification system best uh, suits the data. So for the purposes of this class, we're going to pretty much stick with quantile, four classes. And once you have that, um, you're going to click on apply. And here you have a map. So now that we have the map uh, made up, uh, now we need to set it up into open it up into Print Composer uh, to be able to publish it and save it as a, as a picture. So you can click on um, New Print Layout. You can call it New York State uh, Pop. change and now you're going to have uh, this window. There are a lot of uh, buttons in here so we're going to keep it really sort of uh, basic for this first lab. Um, the first thing that you're going to do is that you're going to um, add a new map layout. So if you if you if you right click if you left click and hold and just make a square, this is going to uh, sort of uh, be the place uh, where the map will be uh, <coughs> pasted, if you will. Now there are a lot of rules. There, there are not a lot of like general rules when it comes to mapping because each map is essentially different. Uh, but a good rule to have when it comes to mapping um, is that the map itself should take most of the space in the map, right? Um, so, for example, here you see that the state of New York is actually rather small uh, compared to the square of the space in which it's in. So you want to increase the scale. And so to do that, uh, you can just actually... Uh, if you click on the scale, you can just uh, hold control and then sort of zoom in. Oh, before we get to that, actually, before we get to that, um, it's in, this is important, right? Um, you know, if, if right now, or if you click this, you can move where the entire map sort of goes, right? Where the whole thing goes. But really, if you're interested about moving the actual boundary, the shape boundary itself, the companion layout, you want to click on on move item content. You want to click on the, you want to move the content uh, inside the map. Uh, now you can just increase the actual uh, scale. Of the map inside the box. And now, if you notice, when you increase the, when so you increase the size of the map, what you're really doing is that you're lowering the scale of the map. Right, you, you. right, we're gonna make this a little bit smaller because for some reason. So you want to make this um, 
you're gonna make this the biggest thing inside the uh, inside your mat inside your actual figure, um, but not too big. Put this sort of move it around until you find the correct place. That is pretty. That's good enough for me. So now that you have that, uh, usually the first thing you want to do is create a title. So if we click on add a label to the layout, uh, you can just sort of uh, create a box to which you want to uh, type your title. And if you click here on main properties, um, you can type New York State counties um, population change 2018. Um, obviously, uh, this title is pretty small, uh, so you can make changes to that if you go to font. Click on font. Uh, you can make this maybe um, like good 18, you can make it bold. Um, let this screw up a little bit more so you can increase that. Uh, you can actually also make it left justified. I think that looks a little bit better. Maybe a little bit smaller, right? The, the, the title, you don't want the title uh, to be way too big. <clears throat> All right, so now that that's done, right, we can also uh, add a, um, a legends layout. Uh, and, you know, it's up to you where you find the, where you place the legend. Um, because of the shape of New York, a good, a good spot is actually um, just to uh, move it uh, to the side. And as you can see, um, this looks not very um, attractive, right? It doesn't look very attractive. Uh, so what we can do really is just to double click and just, you know, you can call it, you can just change the, the content of, of the legend. So we can call this uh, population uh, change. Um, if you can, if you want, you can actually uh, bold this. So if you go uh, to fonts and go to subgroup, you can make it bold. All right. Um, and so now we have a pretty decent uh, legend. Uh, and also an important part of any map is also information about sort of um, where the, you know where you, who authored the map, uh, the date of the map, and uh, where you got the information. So I want all your maps to really have these three pieces. You want to have um, an author. And this should be a very small part of the map because people should only see it if they're really looking for it. Um, the date, which is the first. Okay, so I think the video got cut um, a little bit. So, um, so the last part that you're gonna be writing here is going to be, so is the author, is the date, um, and then the source of information, which in this case is the uh, is the U.S. Census, right? Um, so I think we are fine on that one. Now, um, the two pieces of information which are usually a good thing to add to a map usually is to add uh, a scale bar. Again, you don't want your scale bar to be too uh, huge. Is fine. You can actually also change it um, from kilometers to, let's say, miles. Like miles better. <coughs> 
Um, another thing that you can do to make this a little bit more appealing, um, in, in certain cases, well, we all know where New York City, where New York is, and we all know what the north of New York is. Um, so, if this is not necessary in this case, but usually uh, when we are mapping something that is uncommon or unknown, it might be a good idea to add a north pointer. So you're gonna, to do that, you're gonna add a picture. Click on that. You're gonna create a little square face with a picture. You're gonna go to item properties, search directory. And there we go. You can click on that one. And that's uh, that's pretty okay. All right. So essentially, uh, this map is over, ready to go. But really, the only thing that we haven't changed <coughs> that I should have changed, that I should have changed is the um, the color scheme. Uh, I think originally uh, what I said is that I want um, states um, that have population increases to be represented by red and, and those that have population decreases to be represented by um, blue and we didn't really do that. Uh, and it's not too late to change that. It's actually a pretty straightforward process. So what you'll do is that you'll minimize uh, the uh, you'll minimize <clears throat> the layout. You'll go back uh, to QGIS. You go to properties, and we'll back to symbology. All you'll have to do is right click on uh, right click on the color ramp. And invert color wrap. All right, and then you're gonna click on OK. As you can see, the map in, Q, in QGIS um, flipped the colors. Now, if you go to Print Composer, it still hasn't done that, but it should because it will auto update. Just click uh, click on Move Item Content, uh, click on the map and then it will um, out of all day, update. <coughs> well, the map is ready to go. And we, now you're ready to um, save this as a picture or as a PDF. To do that, you're gonna go to layout, you're gonna go to export as an image or export as a PDF, whatever you want. You're going to find the location and then you're going to save it as a JPEG or whatever format it is that you want. Um, it is also going to ask you about the export uh, the export resolution. Um, you, uh, 300 DPI are, uh, is pretty good. This is pixel density. Um, uh, almost all journals require uh, pictures and maps um, to be of 300, uh, three, uh, to have a pixel density of 300. So this is a pretty good format. You can click on save. And you can save the map and you'll see that you have a, a JPEG of this thing, this map that we created. Now, we've done a lot of work um, and, 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 you know, especially when you work, when you create a map for a journal article, most likely than not, you know, one of the reviewers is going to say, it's going to tell you that, you know, they don't like the color or they to change something about the map, right? Um, so it's always good to actually save the project so that um, essentially what saving the project does is that it saves all this information, not only here uh, in the print composer, but also back here in QGIS, right? This is particularly important when you have multi-layer maps. Um, and so if you um, save, if you click save, 
uh, a safe project, um, you'll be able to save it as a as as a QGIS document. And all you really have to do is to double click that document, and QGIS will open up the map just as you left it. Uh, but it's very important to remember when it comes to this to the projects. Um, that if you move one of the files from the folders, like we move one of the files um, for the maps that you use for that project to another file, it won't work. Everything, all the pathways have to remain the same. So always remember that. Um, that's why you should always have these permanent folders for your projects so that you can, when you click on the save project, <coughs> um, you can find all the information again. All right, so with that, uh, we are going to conclude lab one. Um, if you have any questions, please ask Kai or myself. Um, I will see you all in a couple of days. Take care.